Well, it's 7 o'clock, so good evening and um, welcome to the League of Women Voters of Umpqua Valley's Forum, featuring candidates who are running for a position on the county commission. Um, my name is Jenny Carloni and I will be your moderator. A couple of housekeeping things. There are beverages available in the back and if you need to use a restroom, you would need to go through these doors and the women's is immediately to the right. The men's, you have to go a little farther down the hall and to the right again. Um, if you were to exit through these doors, you would not be able to re-enter through them. There are no door knobs on the outside, on the other side. Um, okay. Um, well, the League of Women Voters was formed in 1920 when the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote. Then and now, the League's mission has been to help voters make informed choices. Despite its name, the League welcomes members of all genders, age 16 and older. Student membership is free. Um, membership forms are available on the side table, in the back, and on our website, which, as you might have noticed, is lwvuv.wordpress.com. Also on our website, under the Voter Information tab, you'll find ballot measures. Um, you'll find impartial information about the five statewide ballot measures. Uh, there are a few copies of that information on a side table as well, um, but it's 10 pages, so we didn't make a lot of copies. So if you don't have online access, you're welcome to take one. Otherwise, you can find that information online. Um, I would like everyone to know that we are having this video taped this evening. It will be on our website. People will be able to access the video there. So anyone who was not able to attend tonight can still hear from the candidates. Um, and let's see. Uh, there will be more information about candidates and ballot measures on the State League's website, LWV. OR.org. Okay, some details about tonight's event. The person who wins this seat in the November 6th election will take office in January 2019, commencing a four year term and replacing interim commissioner Christine Goodwin. We thank all the candidates for coming here this evening to engage with the voters. We really appreciate that. Each candidate will have up to two minutes for self-introduction. Um, in that, they can tell us about themselves and why they have chosen to run for the office. Uh, responses to questions will be limited to 90 seconds. We will vary the response order as we go, so the same person doesn't go first all the time. Each candidate will have one minute for a closing statement. And we'd like to thank in advance, Alice Lackey for being our timekeeper. Please watch Alice up front. Um, and to the audience, many of you have already submitted questions. And if you think of a question, go ahead and write it on a card and hold it up. And one of our league members will take it from you and bring it up so that I can, I can get that question. Um, now, it's, we have a limited num amount of time, and I know we won't get through everyone's questions, so please bear with us. Uh, if similar questions have been submitted, I'll try to ask one that reflects that. League has put together some questions, and some of those may duplicate what you've asked as well. So please listen for slightly different variations on a question you might have submitted. Um, and with that, um, uh, let's see, let's go ahead and begin. We'll start uh, at that end and work this way. So we'll start with James Hoyt. You have two minutes to uh, introduce yourself. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Jim Hoyt. Um, I've lived in Douglas County for over 45 years. Um, I've raised my family here. Uh, I love the county. Um, and I'm doing this because I want to serve the people of Douglas County. Um, I've started two very successful businesses here, um, and I'm working on starting a third right now. Um, I do own the 420 Club on 
uh, North Stevens Street. Um, it's been a really interesting starting that job or starting that business. Um, I got involved in cannabis because I had cancer and uh, it's a very effective medicine and the county needs to change its attitude towards it. Um, the county right now is losing about $20 million a year uh, in uh, tax revenue that we should be getting and using to help the county. Um, there are several reasons why I've decided to run. Uh, I, I About 12 years ago, uh, we voted in that our everybody was so uh, afraid of the taxes. Um, we voted in that the property taxes could only be raised 3%. But what's happened is the taxes have been raised 3% every year. So I'd like to see that changed um, if we put a stipulation on it that it could only be raised maybe twice in a 10-year period, uh, I think that would make a lot of people really happy. Um, thank you. Well, I'm going to try and stand up here. I'm a little short on room back here. <coughs> so I'm Jeremy Salter. Um, not born and raised in Oregon, uh, but my wife and I have been here for six years now. Um, Kind of the reason that we moved to Oregon was uh, we were in California and our kids were getting to the age where they were getting ready to start school and we really couldn't see putting our kids into school in California. Um, so we kind of looked for different options, different opportunities in terms of where we could go, uh, looking for a strong, tight-knit community. Um, the nature of my job allowed me some flexibility in terms of where I work. And Roseburg was where we kind of threw a dart at the map and landed. And, and that's how we got here. Um, and, and again, looking for a better school system, looking for a, uh, a better community than where we came from. And so when we got here, we, we pulled up in the moving truck to the house that we rented. And before I could get the back door open on the truck, my neighbor, Rick Embertson, came walking across the street with a bottle of champagne in one hand and a six pack of beer in the other hand <laughs> to say welcome to the neighborhood. And within a couple hours later, the folks that lived next door to him, Mike and Maureen, walked across with a welcome packet from the Roseburg Visitor Center to say welcome to the neighborhood. And I remember looking at Megan and thinking, boy, did we strike gold. We found exactly what we were looking for. And we immediately jumped in uh, and started getting involved with the community. <coughs> Uh, Megan ran the Booster Club at Hughcrest for a couple of years. Uh, I coached sports at the YMCA for my kids. Um, and then the libraries came under attack. And, and we were kind of shocked by that. And our knee-jerk reaction was to call a real estate agent and, and look for somewhere else to live. And after some conversation and a little bit of soul searching, we decided this was a community worth st staying and fighting for. And that's what we did, and that's why we're here. Thank you. So I'm Alyssa McConnell. I grew up in a rural town in Iowa. I graduated from Northwestern College with a degree in humanities. Humanities is the study of the unique characteristics of people. So jobs brought me to Douglas County. I interacted with over 200 business owners while I was a salesperson at the News Review. I was successful because I got to know them, I educated myself on their business, and served them with fresh ideas. I get stuff done. Upon moving to Myrtle Creek, which I still live there now, I immediately got, I was gonna serve on the Parks Commission. I was on the Parks Commission because I was passionate about our community's biggest asset, our seven parks that we have there. And then I was also elected to the Myrtle Creek Chamber Board in 2017. As the former executive director of the Downtown Association, Downtown Roseburg, this is a business advocacy, economic development, and nonprofit organization, I got stuff done. 
I brought businesses together to participate in change. I influenced the positive perception of downtown. And most importantly, I interacted, listened, responded, and acted on the questions and complaints of any downtown business. I got stuff done. Now, Douglas County is facing many challenges, budget issues, communication issues, but what I've realized is our county is divided politically, and that prevents us from growth, and that prevents things from getting done. I'm running because I am successful and have successful experience in including citizens to build communities to get stuff done. I'm running because I'm frustrated. The more I learn, the angrier I get. People are struggling, our forests are burning, young people are leaving, and the federal government does not care about the issues that they caused. Alex Scarlatos, thank you. I'm here because I care about Douglas County. I want Douglas County to improve, and as the voice of the millennial generation, I'm here to fight for our future. I graduated from Roseburg High School, attended UCC, Joined the Army, started a business, and some of you know about the rest. My life experiences have given me a platform to advocate for the people of Douglas County. Getting timber back is vital for our economy, as well as ONC timber receipts in order to fund county government, and now is the best opportunity we've had in a long time to get something done. And frankly, I think most people can agree we at least need to get some level of forest management back, if nothing else, to prevent the forest fires and create healthier forests and salvage log. We must diversify our economy, and the first step is encouraging more students into the trades to fill the jobs that we have so that we can entice new businesses to come here and bring ancillary businesses with them. I realize I'm the youngest one up here, but I also realize that I have the most diverse life experiences of anyone here, and I realize that I'm the best candidate to actually solve the problems facing the county, not just prevent or delay bankruptcy by a year or two. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ashley Hicks. Can everybody hear me in the back? Okay, perfect. So um, thank you all for coming out tonight. This is a great crowd, uh, might be the largest ones that we've had at one of our forums. So I appreciate you for your time. Um, I am a Roseburg native. I am born and raised here. I've lived here my entire life. Uh, my partner and I started a business, a construction company, in 2001, so residential construction is, um, is my line of work. I recently uh, sold a coffee shop that I had built and operated on the 700 block of Southeast Jackson Street. And that business is still in operation today. Um, Currently, and in 2016, I was elected for Roseburg City Council, and I represent the folks of Southeast um, Roseburg and um, the eastern part of uh, Roseburg area. So I speak for the citizens during city council meetings, and I try to address their concerns the best I can with the time that I have at the mic. Um, my concern um, for Douglas County is increasing housing and also our um, and access to transportation across the county. Um, I have a lot of interests. Uh, some of those are cleaning up the riverfront and um, having safe access for all to our shared assets, and um, and also addressing the homelessness um, crises throughout um, our area specifically. So I thank you all for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions tonight. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to the LVW and all the engaged citizens that came here tonight. My name is Dan Loomis. I am uh, been in the county uh, resident for about 22 years. I lived away from the county for about 29 years, so that makes me about 51 years old. I've been married for 20 years to my lovely wife. She and I both served in the military. I did 23 years in the Army, and she did 24 in the Army. Uh, so we're both retired from the military. We're both combat veterans, both disabled veterans. We uh, have lived in the county 
uh, since about 2014. Um, and as I became um, bored as a retiree, I started attending UCC and getting some ed ed extra education. And while I was there, I became the president of the student veterans organization out there. And in doing so, I became uh, civically involved on behalf of the student veterans. I'd go out to uh, the Veterans Forum, the VetNet, I'd go to uh, the VA town halls. And in addition to that, I added on to my plate going to the Douglas County Commissioner's meetings. And I started that in the beginning of March and watched the process of the May primaries as folks ran against the incumbents and uh, uh, the incumbents got reelected. And then Gary Leaf left his seat and I decided I should step forward. And that is my reason for running. I saw that my county needed good leadership and I'm stepping forward to offer that. And I thank you. Um, good evening, my name is Richard Vandervelden. Thank you for having me here, LB, LWV. I'm uh, from Myrtle Creek originally, born here in Oregon. Um, I didn't see working in a lumber mill like my dad as a viable alternative for me, so I became uh, the fourth generation Navy in my family. I served for 20 years and I worked up through the ranks. I took on a lot of different projects and a lot of different leadership roles. And one of them was I was in charge of a CB battalion and multi-million dollars. Um, I created the security and the infrastructure for the Olympic Village in Salt Lake City. Um, people keep asking me, why do I want to run? Well, Douglas County is in a lot of trouble, and I saw that. I do currently hold office up in Sutherland, but, and, but I needed to step up. I currently, I'm one of the people who have, one of my degrees is in leadership, organi organization, and management. Um, Douglas County needs leadership in office. It needs experienced leadership. It needs skills. I've worked multiple million dollar uh, projects, gradle, uh, grave to cradle. Um, I'm a lifelong learner. Uh, my latest thing since uh, I retired three years ago up in Sutherland is I become a master gardener. Six months ago, I heard about the problems the county was in, so I decided uh, to find out. I started doing the research, and I found out it was right. We are in a lot of trouble. Well, my darling wife and uh, my five children said, put up or shut up. <laughs> so three months ago, I decided to come out, of, take myself out of retirement, use my skills, my knowledge, and my experience, and work for Douglas County, and that's why I'm running for county commissioner. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tom Kress. Thank you for the League of Women Voters for having us here tonight. I was born and raised in Douglas County. After graduating from high school here, I attended the University of Oregon, where I got a degree in accounting. My wife of 37 years and I then moved back to Douglas County where we owned and operated a chain of auto parts stores for the next 15 years. After selling those stores, I accepted a position as the finance director for the CarQuest Corporation, which is headquartered in Lexington, Kentucky. There was the problem. We moved to Kentucky. It wasn't home. It wasn't Douglas County, and we didn't last long. So we moved back. We purchased Waldron's Outdoor Sports, and that was 17 years ago. We've raised three kids here. I have two boys that are foresters with degrees from Oregon State. I have a daughter who is a nurse at the ER over at Mercy with a degree from or Oregon Health Science University. You know, the Board of Commissioners of Douglas County are like the CEOs of a large corporation. They operate a budget of over $140 million. They make human resource decisions. They have to make budgeting decisions. They have to make thousands of decisions that require experience and wisdom every day. I feel like my entire life I've been training for this job. I care very much for this county. I raised my kids here. I want to raise my, my grandkids here. I want to see them raised here. 
Um, I am the candidate that has, for years, you know, signed both sides of the paycheck, looked for revenue sources where they're hard, tough to find, balanced the budget even when the times were tough. So I'm ready to go to work on day one, and there'll be no learning curve with me. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. We've heard a little from each of the candidates, and uh, now we'll begin with the questions. And the first question will be answered first by um, Jeremy Salter, and we'll proceed in this direction with uh, James Hoyt being last. Um, so the question, sorry. Yes. Oh, yes, there's one here in the front row in the middle and one there in the middle. Um, and one there, thank you for raising your hand, and one, and no, some are being reserved. Um, apologize for not having enough chairs, but we'll give people a moment to find those if they can. Okay, so as I mentioned, we'll start this one with Jeremy and then we'll do the rounds. So the question is, um, who contributed what to your campaign and what do they expect in return? Ninety seconds, yes. That's loaded. <laughs> so my, my campaign has not raised nearly as much as some of my competitors have. Um, but I will say this. Every donation that I've received has been from an individual. These are folks that I've gone out and I've talked to, folks I've met at house parties, folks that I've met out you know, at, at different events that have, that have liked what I had to say and decided to to throw support to my campaign. As far as expectations, I don't think anyone who has supported my campaign has any expectations different than any other citizen in this county. And I think that's one of the things that I bring to the table is representation. We ha Alyssa alluded to it that we have, I'm s yes, Alyssa alluded that we have a, a political divide in this county. Part of the job of the commissioners is to bridge that gap. I'm a moderate, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican. I'm right in the middle. I am the bridge. So I'm Alyssa, and three people have donated to cam my campaign. I have made my website all by myself, do all my social media, and also the people that have donated to my cam campaign, most of them are from downtown Roseburg, and they have seen me bring people together. They have seen me um, market, and they have seen me listen and respond to complaints. So most of the dollars are basically, I'm doing it. <laughs> um, I think that's it. I think we've only had one person who's given more than 2500 to my campaign so we've had we've been doing pretty good don't get me wrong but we've had a lot of small donations from a lot of different people um especially in the timber industry because again I am very passionate about solving the ONC timber issue because that's how county gets their money there's no other way to really cut it we could triple our property taxes and it wouldn't fund the amount of money we need and frankly timber is the only way at least for county government but I do believe we need to diversify our economy but to answer the question I've I've had a lot of small and medium-sized donations from all over the county um, all political backgrounds thank you okay um, I think that's a really great question and I'll start off by saying this, that I am a con fiscally conservative person. The money that I've spent on my campaign is money that comes from my family and our household. Um, I realize that we are in a cash-strapped community and a lot of folks are living off of a very tight budget and um, I just I couldn't bring it upon myself to go around begging and, and asking of my community members to throw money that would be spent on buttons and signs and banners 
So um, the money that I have spent on my campaign has come from my pocket and our family's um, household. The social media that I do is all um, on my own um, and on my own time and of my own cost. So I appreciate the, the question. Thank you. The beginning of my campaign, I s focused on uh, educating myself on how to be a good candidate. I didn't spend any time uh, asking for donations or endorsements. The uh, donations that I have received uh, from maybe five or six donors uh, only equals about half of what I've actually spent out of my pocket uh, in the beginning to create signs and flyers and cards. Thank you. Um, I've s received three small checks in the mail. I'm retired. All my budget comes out of my back pocket. Now, one of the ladies, Republican ladies in the county, has supported me. She had a barn up and drain with a bunch of old signs from way past elections. She volunteered them. I drove up to drain, picked them up, my old truck, took them down. My daughter and I have been making signs in the back yard. <laughs> Strap some paint on, stencil them highlight them so they pop out a little bit and that's been it. Uh, last week I actually broke down and spent for three of the big signs $180 for every one of the three of the big signs and $3 for the little ones. So I could afford 20 of the little ones and three of the big ones. If anybody noticed I have them out in strategic places. What I, what I felt was I wasn't going to owe anybody especially outside influences, even lumber mills or anybody, anything uh, attached to me. I would be working for the county. I'm fiscally frugal, and this is my way of doing it. Having lived here my whole life, I am shocked at the generosity of some of my family and friends. And frankly, that's, that's the, the bulk of my donations. And there's been, it, it's just amazing to me the people that have came in to my store and just gave me $20 and put it in an envelope and said, hey, we need someone like you running. Now, I do have some, some big donors as well. I have some, some uh, mills that also want to see somebody fiscally responsible in there running the show so that, that the county doesn't become a burden to them as well. But I will tell you that for the most part, I've just had people come in and say, we need somebody like you. Thank you for doing the job, and what can I do to help? Thank you. Um, my name is Jim Hoyt again. Um, I haven't taken a penny from anyone. Um, I don't really need to do that. Uh, the money that I'm going to spend, it'll be my own. Um, I've been taught that everything has it a price, and so if you take money from certain people, certain businesses, uh, they're going to expect something in return. Um, I'm strongly opposed to the pipeline, so I would not take a penny from the logging companies. They will spend a lot of money to try to get that through, um, and there's no way that I'm going to be indebted to anyone. Um, for any special favors. I want to serve the people of Douglas County, and that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. With um, Alyssa on this one. Oh, federal, okay, federal timber policy may or may not change. What innovative ideas do you have for generating revenue for county services? There's several things that we can do. We have land here. There are other things that can grow on our land besides just trees. Yes, there's marijuana, there's hemp, there's wine, there's orchards, we even need to work on that. There's many more things. But I really feel that as for timber, yes, it is the base of our economy and it's been around a very long time. 
But we really need to think outside the box and look towards the future. Not completely ditch plan A, which is timber, but we have three commissioners. How about two work on timber and the third one can look for other resources and continue to do that. I'm very small government minded. Um, frankly, we've been kind of, I'm trying to put this politely, uh, bent over the barrel by the federal government uh, when it comes to the timber issue. I mean, they own 60% of our county and we receive almost no compensation for that. So frankly, it's really the only way we can fund county government. Granted, I believe that we need to diversify our economy. There's a lot we can do economically, but unfortunately that always does not help county government. That being said, we do have a lot of unused county lands that I believe we can sell off to help fund the county short term. And frankly, I mean, we have an RV park at the coast that I believe we should sell off. I mean, that is, we can't get mad at the federal government for owning 60% of our county and not compensating for it, and then do the same thing to our own citizens on the county level. To me, that's hypocritical. But that's what I believe. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll share with you this, is that I'm a product of the timber industry. My, uh, my dad will uh, retire from Roseburg Forest Products and uh, has worked there his entire life. So that's uh, that, that revenue and those funds have literally I've been raised on. So um, I hope that there's, um, you know, regulations that can be changed to allow more um, harvest of timber or responsible harvest of timber. Um, to be quite frank, I don't see us going that direction, so I think that it's best that we sort of accept that as our reality and, um, and we continue to work on um, the issues that we can and, the, and support Commissioner Freeman, the work that he's doing in Washington and um, with the ONC um, lands. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for hemp to be used as agricultural um, product in our county. Um, I also think that there's room for the hop industry and our wine industry to continue to grow. Um, I think that, um, that there's opportunities for the marijuana um, issues to go back in front of the voters and I would support that and I also um, am a huge supporter of rural tourism and think that we can um, do a lot of good supporting our main streets throughout rural Douglas County and supporting and um, our shared assets throughout the county and um, continue to focus in in the areas of shared um, assets thank you Yes, we need to find something other than timber. One of the first steps uh, that I would take is to encourage economic development. And to do that, I would work with the state, the county, and the cities to get them out of the way, get government out of the way to allow people to easily, more easily build. If I ask a certain amount in property tax from this individual, I can't get any more added to that count, the county's uh, coffers. Right now, we've got a $140 million budget and like only nine million of it comes from property tax. But if I can encourage somebody on this side and that side to build a house, a business, an industry, it brings in more property tax revenues. And to get that done, I've got to get government out of the way, make Douglas County stand out as the best county that you want to come build a family, a life, a business, develop an industry. Thank you. Uh, right now, Douglas County's got a shortfall of $20 million a year. Every year that goes up an additional four years. Our $9 million taxes only subsidize part, fill in part of that. The rest is coming out of revenue. Now, as I see it and uh, done some research, there's three main ways of getting us from stopping from going off that cliff in three years from now. One, we get our ONC money back. That $1.4 billion lawsuit against U.S. Forest Service, if that comes through, great, we're flush again. S 
suing BLM, getting part of that money back. We're flush again. Second way is selling off surplus properties. Now, our county commissioners, anybody who's going to the meetings, have been hearing about, they've been doing that right and left. They've been starting businesses, you know, whether you think uh, a government is supposed to run an individual business or not, our county commissioners have to come up with money. So them starting that RV park over at the coast is an important first start, giving us $100,000 and then $400,000 a year. The third way is one that I absolutely am against, most people are against, and that's raising our taxes through the roof. That $16 million tax raise you heard about for the sheriff, that's very unpopular but at least that would stop us from going over the roof. So the main fight is getting our timber money back. Right now, Douglas County only owns 4,400 acres of land. There's no way we could sell that, even though it would pay for it, and keep going for the future. Thank you. So the bottom line is I do believe that we're going to get more harvest on the ONC lands, and I do think that will help the situation. But we do have a big budget deficit. We can do all the economic development in the world, and it really doesn't do the math if you think about it, because the only way the county gets money is through property taxes. We're limited by the state laws on how much the property taxes can come to. You know, we get assessed, uh, the county gets a dollar eleven per thousand. So it's not very much. In the city of Roseburg, you're paying ten dollars per thousand. Can't go up. That's state mandated. So basically, you have to Think outside the box, which is what the commissioners did with the Discovery Point. That may very well prove to be successful and fund the park system. Then you have to find the other departments that can, can they be self-funded? Or like the Parks Department now, has it collected enough fees in order to, to fund itself? Then the, you know, then the bottom line is, is that smaller governments, go, well, we've got a $140 million budget. Maybe we need to make it a smaller government and live within our means. But bottom line is, is I do think we're going to have more harvest in the future. The pendulum has swung. It swung. It, we were cutting way too much. Then, then it went all the way back. Now we're swinging a little bit back towards the middle, and I think that will definitely ease the county's problems. Thank you. Uh, the logging industry is pretty much finished. <coughs> um, we have to stop counting on that for the income of the county, and we can't be bl blaming the government. Um, the county can take care of itself. Um, one thing that I would do is I actively would uh, pursue the cannabis business. Um, we are about $20 million a year uh, in debt with the county, and that's right about what the cannabis industry would be giving uh, Douglas County annually um, because the county has opted out. Um, we get nothing right now. Um, just about four months ago, um, the state released over $90 million to all of the counties that do participate. So, like I said, that's one answer that we have right in front of us. All we need to do is change it and accept that money. The money is there, and we just need to take it. Thank you. So, I agree on the marijuana issue. I, I think that's kind of a general consensus. I would love to see that go back before the voters so that we could capitalize on some of that tax revenue. Uh, there are also some things that we can use some help with at the state level, and I kind of happen to know a candidate for the House of Representatives. She may have left, my wife. Um, it, when we talk about timber and we think back to the 90s and how the timber industry used to be taxed versus how it's taxed today, when you adjust for inflation, we're collecting about 85% less in taxes from the timber industry than we did in the 90s. That's something that I think can make a big dent in, in our current budget issues. Uh, there are also some other creative ideas. Uh, we spend um, eight, nine million dollars a year on benefits for our county employees. Could we possibly use that to self-insure? 
Could we do something different? Could we build a clinic and, and take care of the, the medical and dental needs for our, for our county employees? I think ideas outside the box like that are really where we need to go if we're going to solve these problems. This, this is not a new problem. It's been a problem for a long time. And, and we really haven't done a good job as a county combating this problem. So those are some of my ideas. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I was thinking that oh, I'm asleep at the wheel here. OK, um, so the next question will start with Alex. And it, um, it repeats the timber theme in a different way. So um, we know that there's still plenty of timber being harvested on private lands. And Jeremy uh, alluded to some of the um, historical monies that came in from that. So this question is, uh, what is your view on the rate of severance tax paid by private timber landowners, none of which currently goes to the county. And we'll start with Alec. Well, correct, they, they do pay a severance tax, but it does not go to the county. But frankly, I am not for raising it because, <laughs> I mean, they're already leaving and buying property on the East Coast because they're not allowed to log enough here. They can't even keep their mills running. If we treat them any worse, frankly, we're going to lose them all. And um, timber is still 24% of this county's GDP. And if we lose that, then we're going to be a whole lot worse than we are now. We need to start encouraging business, timber and otherwise, if we want our county to grow economically and, of course, to fund county government through federal forest lands. And, I mean, it's, it's so lopsided when you think about the amount of timber that's being logged on private lands. Frankly, they're having to log a lot because there's no timber coming off ONC lands, which again is 60% of this county. We need to create a balance so that we can fund county government and we're not over logging the forest. Okay, Ashley would be next. And I encourage you, Ashley, to hold that right up close to your mouth. Okay, like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I am not encouraging um, raising taxes for private timber or for anybody else that lives in this community. So I think that there's other ways that we can go about being creative about increasing the value of the timber that's being harvested on private land. And there has been talk of the, the bids, the, um, the timber at the timber purchases during the auctions have increased over the last several years. And um, quite frankly, I think that that's a good way for that to go and, and, and for the value of the trees to be higher and, and, uh, and for them to be paying more um, during the auctions for, for the timber that they are harvesting. So I think there's other ways that we might be able to look at that same issue. I'm not in favor of uh, increasing taxes, severance tax, to uh, private landowners. Um, they are spending a lot of money taking good care of their land and marketing their product, their timber. Uh, I live out off of Taiyi Road, and there is a helicopter out there spraying. Somebody's taking care of their private timber to make sure that it's still marketable. The federal government is not. As Alec alluded to, uh, I spoke to Roseburg Forest Products, and yes, they are buying property in South Carolina because it's hard to mark or get timber here, market it. It's hard to get labor here, uh, and that's how I feel about it. Thank you. Uh, the biggest business here in Douglas County right now is BLM selling off our property, our BLM lands, to private industries. We are collecting only 10% of the income off of private lands that we did not just 20 years ago. Uh, the legislature up in Salem has made it easier and easier um, for private lands to keep their revenue and not give it back to the county. Three-fourths of the remaining lands from BLM are being put in reserves. Now that leaves us one fourth. The one fourth we seem to be getting of the land that's been burnt, the part that the owl lives on, or the part that the tree frog lives on. Um, 
Last year, we only logged 1 million board feet. 500,000 of that was ONC land. So we are getting money in. And like Mr. Crest says, yes, we've, we've hit the bottom of the barrel. We are starting to slowly come back up. Whether we can get enough in the next three years to hold off the cliffside is to be seen. Um, yes. I'm also not in favor of uh, changing the severance tax for the private timber companies. They make an easy target right now. I mean, we look at it as county needs money, they're, they, they, they're booming. But uh, frankly, they've had a, a lot of tough times over the past. They've come through that, and right now is their time. But, you know, they have the Canadian lo logs that they're having to compete with that's subsidized. We have the South that is, has the plantation farms. So we're kind of lucky to have the industry we have, and I think, I, you know, sometimes I don't think they're appreciated. But that being said, you know, growing up here, I don't remember seeing clear cuts like I've seen going up and down I-5. From Glendale to Cottage Grove, you see nothing but clear cuts. We've swung the pendulum so hard that they're forcing all the, all the timber harvest on 10% of the land now. If we could all get together and just say, look, let's, let's just harvest a little bit more on the federal lands so that we don't have that high compression of all this, we would, we would solve a lot of these problems. Thank you. No, I don't think that we should be raising the taxes for private people. Um, I remember speaking with my father when he flew in from Connecticut, um, and he, all he remarked upon is how he could see along the freeway how they had left all of the timber along the freeway so everything looked nice, but everything that he flew over the state was all logged, and it was down to nothing, and he actually couldn't believe his eyes um, anymore. And I really don't believe that we should be cutting a lot of our old growth timber that's left. We need to have something left for our, our kids and their kids. Um, but we definitely should not be raising taxes on the small guy. I know lots of people are going to cut their uh, property. I know people that are doing it now, and uh, you know they're doing it for a little bit extra cash. And I've got a piece of property that I may cut, um, but once again, it's going to be done responsibly, and we can't be raising a lot of taxes for people doing that. Thank you. So, the severance tax for. Uh, Jim referred to the the small guy, um, not not for that. But again, there there are so many loopholes that have been created over the last 30, 40 years, uh, in in how timber is harvested and how it's taxed. Um, those are really some of the places that we need to focus. And really, when it when it comes to timber and managing the forest, we, we've got an issue. And the issue is there aren't enough voices at the table. There is a small group. That, that, that's calling the shots. We need more people involved. We need experts from all sides of the, the, the forest issue, management issue to be heard and have a voice and, and sit down and talk. And they need folks to sit and moderate because those are opposing views and they're pretty strong emotions when it comes to timber. And, and someone to moderate and, and help bring folks together, have conversation, develop solutions together that satisfy all parties involved. Thank you. I'm going to go along there with, yeah, we shouldn't focus on one entity to tax. Now, the idea did work in the 90s, and I know that Washington and California still have that in effect, and that's what um, funds their schools and their roads, or goes to part of those funds. But I'm interested in finding a solution that if we do reinstate that tax or receive those monies, that how can we make it fair across the board for all private entities or industry? What ideas do you have for reducing the amount of waste that goes into our landfill? 
Another good question. Yeah, so, you know, I was part of the generation that we were taught in school every single year about the reduce, reuse, recycle, um, you know, and then in, later on you added the, the last R, which was repurpose, you know. So, um, you know, reducing our impact and, and, and what we're adding to the landfill is a responsibility of each household, each member of our community um, from my perspective. Okay, so um, it's really unfortunate that we're in the situation that we are with not having the recycle um, opportunities that we've recently lost. Um, extremely disappointing from my, from my perspective. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for educating the public in those, those PSA commercials and radio announcements and continuing that education of teaching our youth and, and, um, and maybe even office spaces within different um, organizations in our community to reduce their impact to the environment. Uh, I think that there's opportunity with the landfill to consider um, incinerator. I know that that's uh, something that some of the folks in Northern California are doing. There's emission issues with that. I think that there's something to be looked at. The, there's a um, organizations that's creating so much power from their incinerator that they have an overflow of energy and so that's that's being passed on to the residents within their community and is becoming um, something that's adding value to their budget. So thank you. I'd like to talk more about that. One of the, the best things that can happen, I think, is for it to be a public issue. So we should, as commissioners, as community uh, leaders, we should be setting an example for everyone to uh, properly uh, reuse, recycle, um, maybe set up community organizations, neighborhood organizations where uh, you will recognize and award uh, communities or, or neighborhoods for uh, accomplishing a certain level of recycling. Um, also we need to relook at the idea of a, a recycle separating plant uh, where we employ f local folks to separate the, the recycle. Um, you know, a lot of people are, are commenting about how uh, Eugene and Portland are still recycling. But the fact of the matter is that they have enough money to keep people employed that are moving recycled material. But the fact of the matter is, is that recycled material, most of it is going into landfills until we get a customer for our West Coast re uh, recyclables. There is a, I think, a uh, warehouser plant up there that might be taking cardboard right now, but they have the ability to easily transport and legit, uh, because that plant is near uh, Eugene and Portland, it costs us a lot of money to move glass, cardboard, and stuff up north. Thank you. I'm a retired vet and a master gardener. Everything on my place gets reused and recycled. Whether it goes in compost, whether I use plastic jugs to heat my greenhouse during the winter because it has no electricity. As for the county, we're wasting $100,000 $100, a year dumping all this recycle in our, in our landfill when we shouldn't be. We should be making this landfill actually make us money. There's no reason all this plastic has to go up there. Europe's been doing, using plastic for years in their road bases. Most of the plastic that going in there can be used in road bases. The glass, that's 18,000. The plastic, 60,000 a year are wasting. We have wineries around here. We're buying glass from China at 50 cents a bottle. Well, if you buy the right machines, you set up the right equipment and a plant in the right place, we can make bottles at 27 cents a bottle. That's going to save the wineries a lot of money. They're going to be able to hire more people. They're going to be able to pay more tax money. The county will not only get the revenue from that tax money, but to also save the money for what's not getting in our landfill. So this landfill that was supposed to last us till 20, 2023, that's now not going to last us then. Hopefully can, we can extend the life of it out a few years. You know, the fact of the matter is that recycling has never been free. It's a market-driven thing. And we as citizens have got to do a better job. You know, we, we've, we say we're going to recycle, but only when it's convenient. 
and we've got to get this stuff clean. When, when the cardboard bins time and time again have diapers in them and other trash, it's no wonder we lost that market. So what you're going to have happen is we're going to have domestic markets develop, I believe, that's going to do some of the, the products because it's just going to be a matter of money. We're going to all of a sudden have to spend a little bit more to recycle or we're going to get it cleaner and then it's going to be a market demand again and it's going to come back where places like China will, will buy our recyclable products. But right now, we were making it too expensive for them. By the time they sorted it all out, it, it wasn't worth doing it for what they were paying for it. So it's not free, and we've just got to do a better job of education, and we've got to do a better job of recycling ourselves. We've got to police ourselves. Thank you. Uh, they're all right. We uh, absolutely have to start recycling better ourselves. Uh, we have to start looking for new and better markets you know, to sell our recyclables. Um, so that really is going to be one of the answers right there, is to find some new market, new markets for uh, the people that want those recyclables. Um, so, and then another thing that, I mean, like I said, we do need to do a better job ourselves. Um, you know, we still are handing out plastic bags in the grocery store. Most places all over the state has stopped that. Um, you, the plastic is going crazy. It's got plastic everywhere. So we need to cut back on that, and I think that would be a good start. Thank you. So I'm, I've been in business for... 20 years, I've run a small business, I've worked in a major size corporation, I, I currently work for a mid-sized corporation. When we have problems in business, we look to experts to help us solve those problems. And this case is no different. I recently met with a master recycler, uh, his name's Ron Thompson, uh, and I got a chance to really understand part of the issue. Um, you know, China stopped buying recyclable materials from us, and, and that was largely due to how it's sorted. They would get a shipment and about 60% of, uh, of the material was sorted properly, the other 40% was, was, was junk, it was waste. And that was a big driver in why they stopped buying our recyclable materials. Uh, in talking to Ron, there are solutions out there. And they're not simple, they're fairly complex, but they're doable. Uh, starting with a machine that can sort recyclable materials with a 96% accuracy rate. That's big. That gets us back into the market with folks who are looking to buy recyclable materials. This, this complicated plan, and I won't go into the details because I have 90 seconds, but it also creates jobs for local folks, and that's important. So we can accomplish our, our objectives in, in terms of recycling. We can create jobs, and that's a win-win. In order to attract a new market, we need to be sellable. I think that we need to focus on reuse. And where does that start? In elementary school. So do we remember the D.A.R.E. program in the 90s when we had to watch videos in school about drugs? How come we don't have to watch those about reuse and recycling and start putting that in the minds of our children to adapt a lifestyle that actually helps the economy in the future. I think that we can do temporary solutions and whatnot, but in order to change basically how we live and what we're used to in the matters of recycle and reuse, we have to learn. And so we have to start with the children. Well, we didn't cause this problem, and frankly, we're probably not going to be able to solve it ourselves. It's an entire nationwide issue, frankly. Um, and what's probably going to end up happening is we're just going to have to become more efficient, like Europe. There's going to be recycling centers up and down the West Coast that are each going to specialize in recycling a different product. And we need a push to have one of those here in Douglas County. And frankly, it's going to take some time, but in the meantime, I'd like to see private dumps open back up to at least compete with the county dump to hopefully get costs down and take the load off the county dump. 
Okay, interesting that you should mention private um, options because the next question is, uh, some people have proposed uh, privatizing county services to save money, and we know that this was done with public health. Um, the question is, if the county privatizes services, how will the public know we are receiving the same or better services per dollar spent than we were before the privatization? And we'll let Daniel start. We are spending our reserves, uh, $20 million a year, and we've only got $60 million left. So that's three years. We have to privatize. We have to cut government. We have to find private industry that will do it cheaper. And there's a process to get it cheaper. You take bids. You review them. You make sure that they um, meet the contract requirements. And in doing so, that bid or that... Uh, that a private industry is going to meet your requirements. That's just that simple. There's a, a lot of different departments. There's a lot of different offices in the county uh, courthouse. Privatization, um, the biggest one that initially just meets my mind is the $8.4 million that we are paying for health and insurance for county employees. Uh, this is where we're paying over or up to 80 and sometimes in case 100% for this. Very few people out here get that type of insurance. Now, when county employees were getting hired at $21,000, $25,000 a year, they needed an incentive, good medical and uh, dental plans to entice them in. Now that most of our county employees are making forty-five to 55000 a year, which is more than most people in uh, median Douglas County, we need to look at privatizing that industry and saving some money. So one of the first things that comes to my mind is the what's currently being looked at is the privatization of our transfer sites. Um, each of the disposal companies in the given area, whether it be Sutherland's and Reed's Port Disposal is looking at the transfer sites there. Roseburg's looking at running them here. And we're not talking about the dump. We're just talking about the transfer site themselves. So I think that's pretty simple to say, well, if they can do it for less money, we're probably getting our bang for our buck on that. It becomes more complicated when you're talking about different issues, such as the road department, our fleet services. So we have, a f we have full staff of mechanics that take care of our vehicles. Are we getting our most from them? You know, we might be, but I think at least we put a request for bid out there to see what somebody else would do it for, just to see w where we're at with it. And then that's where you have to write that proposal really well so that you know that you are getting what, you, you know, you're, what you asked the question was, are we getting the same, you know, what we want for the money? We at least have to look at that and see. We may be getting a good deal right now, but we've got to at least look. Uh, the county really doesn't need to be in business. Um, the county should be taking bids on lots of different things. Um, definitely, we can just be real wise about who we hire and um, we definitely don't need to be in the business. Thank you. So I kind of think of this issue in terms of, uh, again, business. Uh, we use a lot of subcontractors in business, and uh, the company I work for, we are a subcontractor as well. And the company that we do the bulk of our work for has performance metric standards. And I think you can apply that same concept and, and set forth standards in your proposal with, if you're going to look to privatize an industry. Uh, Tom mentioned the, the transfer sites. If that's something that we feel like is a good option, I think there are ways to manage that. Uh, but I think one of, the primary, one of the primary things you have to do is you have to build and have a solid relationship with whoever that is that you're, you're planning to bring in and do what the county was doing. Uh, and again, the, the performance metrics need to be clearly defined and outlined before you enter into an agreement with that company. And if they can't meet those performance metrics, there need to be consequences to that. 
That's how we operate in business. If, if, if we don't hit our performance metrics, that costs us money. If we hit our performance metrics, we're, we're okay. Treating a, a, a business that wants to do or perform a, a service that the county is currently performing should be no different. The Board of Commissioners is our local contract, contract review board. And the question is how will we know that we're getting our bang for our buck if we privatize? Again, with performance metrics, yes. But also reviewing contracts and not being able, not being afraid to say no to a company if it's not working out. There needs to be more, and, and also being honest about it with the people as it's happening. So I think that privatization, it gets a little bit scary sometimes with monopolies and whatnot. But as for relationships, as long as the contracts are reviewed on a quarterly basis and making sure everybody's up to standards and doing things right, then it will be successful. But I would like to see more of that happening. Well, after doing some time in the military, I mean, you cannot imagine how inefficient bureaucracies are and frankly we need to cut down on those wherever possible especially with the budget the way it is I mean I, I would love to see private companies bid for public works projects of course transfer sites and things of that nature but private industry frankly always does it better I mean and when it comes to enforcing standards competition will do that for you and of course your county commissioners that's what they're there for and uh, private industry, like I said, with competition, they'll always weed out the weaker. So if you have a private company that does a bad job repaving a road, they don't get the contract next time. Or if it's bad enough, you sue them for compensation. Okay, I think this is one of those areas where there's a bit of balance. I mean, I think that in, in some instances that it would be... <clears throat> A, a, a more responsible way about uh, making sending those RFPs out and getting bids on the work. On the other hand, I think that it's important that we provide those services that the citizens expect through their, the tax that they pay um, and their expectations to their local government. I, I think that um, there's opportunity to um, create a workforce within our community that could that could go out and um, and provide some of those services to the county and I think that there's um, there's other creative ways of, of, of educating and training our current workers to complete the projects that are expected and that are needed throughout the county Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Would you name, please, um, one action the present Board of Commissioners has taken with which you agree and why you agree and one action they've taken with which you do not agree and tell us why not? And we'll start with Mr. Vanderbilt. Uh, one that I agree with. I agree with the Umpqua Parks over there in... in Reed Sport. The reason being is we have tasked Mr. Boyce with finding ways of preventing us from going bankrupt. And that by taking a land that had already had failed, us buying this failed land and creating a winning, working RV park that's bringing us money, that's a plus. Something I'm against. I'm against the uh, pipeline, Jordan Cove. I'm against 229 miles of destruction strewn across our state, going through our creeks, under our rivers, uh, paying pennies on the dollar, eminent domain, throwing ranchers, farmers, people out of their home or off their ranch because now the ranch, uh, because it has a big gapping hole through it, can't produce the lumber, the animals that it used to. One of the things that 
uh, I'm definitely for that they've done is they partnered with uh, and got state grants to match through the Economic Development Fund. They got Fred Wall Marine out of their little tiny hole in the wall over in Reedsport and moving them to the island there that American Bridge vacated and left us high and dry with. This is a homegrown industry that they took. This is the, this is the shipyard that builds those ships on America's deadliest catch. Pretty neat operation, and it's right here. And now that, that business is employing way more people. It's putting that land back on the tax rolls, and it's making a really good product. Now, one of the issues that I disagree a little bit was the closing of the library, and I'll tell you why. Mostly because the plan was already in the place to keep them open. It's going to be reopened by October. They already knew that it could be open. I think with what I want to do with economic development and reaching across the aisle to, to the other side of things, I think this is a gym that we should have left open just because we knew it was going to be open again, and we should have continued to work behind the scenes in the situation that is now, but I think that we may have been a little short-sighted in closing it. Okay. Jim Hoyt. Well, I strongly disagree with the purchasing of the mobile home park on the coast. Um, you know, maybe at a better time when the county has a lot of money, if we were making money on it, that would be great. It's projected that they would. But in a time when you're really strapped for money, you don't go taking your money that you do have and spending it on a long-term project. So that definitely was a wrong thing to do. And the only good thing, um, we need to get the library back open. So whatever the heck we can do to get that open, I'm disappointed that it's taking so long. Um, it should be open now, and we need to get it open soon. So I wasn't real thrilled about the idea of the county buying the RV park. Um, I don't generally like the idea of, of government competing with private business. Uh, however, in this case, I have seen that there is some potential benefit there. Um, from what I understand, the park is starting to turn a profit, which makes it valuable, which means that we could turn that back to the market and sell it, and we can come away with some cash. Um, what do I not like? Um, <laughs> Well, you heard my story about the library, so I won't go there again. Um, the, the LNG pipeline, uh, this conditional use permit that was approved for the LNG or for the pipeline uh, was not a, a permit that was granted to Jordan Cove. It was granted to one of the first companies that wanted to come in and put a pipeline in. And I don't feel that it's right that another company could come in with a similar plan and just assume the use of that same conditional permit. So that, that's something that I certainly disagree with. An action I agree with is how long they waited to hire an interim commissioner. I'm sure they saved a lot of money this year doing that. <laughs> um, something I don't agree with is the level of transparency in explaining and informing the public. Now, the bare minimum is mostly met, but what I mean by this is marketing and trying to recruit people for um, their commissions and whatnot, the accessibility of their website. There's no search tool. I'm going to say that. There's no search tool and loads of information in it. Um, basically, why I'm so adamant about that is because as elected officials, you represent the people, and there's 109,000 plus people in Douglas County. So, and there's three of us. So how is the best way that we are going to maximize information that we get to the public so that the public can be educated and included in our decisions, in our decisions? I agree with the direction we're headed on ONC. 
However, I believe we could be doing a lot more and exploring different alternatives. There's a lot of good ideas out there that are being talked about, but not in Douglas County. So I, I think I would be a good compliment to the current commissioners when it comes to solving ONC, but I do think they're headed on the right direction there. I disagree completely with RV Park on the coast. Um, frankly, I just do not like the idea of government competing in private business. I agree that business-wise, if government was a business, I do think it was a good decision. They are turning a slight profit. However, I don't trust the government and I don't trust bureaucracy. And if the government can open a RV park on the coast, who's to say they can't open a gas station to supply that RV park with fuel? Who's to say they can't supply a small grocery store to supply them with food? It, to me, it's just a very slippery slope and I just don't trust the government. And the bottom line is they're putting their own interests over the interests of local people, which, again, I disagree with completely. Okay, so one of the things that I'm dissatisfied with the county commissioners um, is in their response to the recycling. I think that there is a lot of opportunity to utilize the work, um, the workers uh, that are there on site, the volunteer um, work crew workers to clean up the recycling areas and to provide a a clean recycling experience for those using um, our landfill to, as a donation place for, for that activity. I, um, I do agree and I like the fact that they um, made the decision to purchase the permanent pump for the leachate um, at the landfill and to make a preventative um, barriers from that leachate entering into the South Umpqua River. And I do appreciate the oversight of the Department of Environmental Quality for our commissioners while that area is being addressed and being cleaned up. Um, thank you very much. Things I agree with that the county has done. 90 acres sold off to Oregon only to bring a Oregon-themed resort to Sutherland, good. 13 acres of VA federal property is being sold back to the state, and they're going to create a 151-bed uh, veterans' home, jobs, places for the veterans. That's good. What I think they could be doing better, what they haven't done good. Uh, the current commissioners have been in uh, office for four years, the two incumbents, and the interim hasn't been there for very long. But during those four years, uh, we've come to the point where we've got our reserves down to 60 million and we're burning through 20 a year. They should have cut more sooner. That should have happened. And now we're down in uh, some desperate territory and I think that sh should have happened earlier. Okay, well, um, the time has flown by. We're going to m go ahead with our closing statements at this time. So, Tom Crest, you will be first. You have one minute to um, give us your closing statement. I'm running for Douglas County Commissioner because I want to help improve the educational opportunities of the youth in this area. I want to. I want to be able to being have well-trained workers for employers and manufacturers to use so that we can help our local economy. But at the same time, I would like to promote an, an environment of innovation and entrepreneurship. My accounting degree and my degree, my work in finance has made me uniquely qualified for this role. I've owned businesses for over 30 years and I have balanced the budget even when times were tough. I know what it's like to operate a business in the black. I'm the only candidate that can stand before you and say I've lived here for over 50 years. I've run a business for over 30 years. I've got a degree in accounting. I've raised three kids here. I would like your support now and your vote in November. Thank you. Uh, I've been here for about 45 years. Um, I have raised my family here. Um, I've worked for several years as a reserve police officer. 
Um, I know a lot of the problems that the county is facing. Um, we're facing a huge drug problem right now. Um, because of my police experience, I know firsthand where it's happening and what's going on with it. Um, we need to be looking at it as a disease. It's, uh, it is a disease. It's uh, not just something that, you know, people being bad are doing. Um, we need to correct it. Um, I'm aware of a lot of these problems, and I know a lot about how to correct them. So I hope that you can vote for me. Um, I'll do a good job. Thank you. So I've got a very broad range of experience. Uh, I was a Marine. Uh, I was a small business owner. I was an investigator, investigating internal theft and fraud. Um, I've worked in, I, I, again, run, run my own small business. I've worked for a very large corporation. I work for a medium-sized corporation now. Uh, my experience and my skills certainly put me in the category for, for being qualified for this position. And there are a lot of issues in Douglas County that, that need attention. And one of the things that we are lacking is, again, inclusion. It's, it's, we need more than a small group of people to be making decisions for this county. And voices need to be heard. And we need a candidate on that board of commissioners that will listen and allow people to say what they have to say. There are a lot of really, really intelligent people in this community. I've talked to many, many people in my, my six or seven months of campaigning, and I've heard some great ideas. We need to put those ideas into place and give them a voice. I want to thank everyone for coming here tonight. And I also wanted to say, I think it's a benefit that I have not lived here my whole life. Now, people tell me not to say this in public, but no, I am not from here. But with that being said, I have a vision that is from the outside that will help us think outside of the box to get stuff done. I am really happy that everyone asked really good questions tonight. I will die asking questions, and I will die until I get answers. But the reason I'm so adamant about that is because I like to learn, I have experience, and I just want to get stuff done. Douglas County is an excellent place to live. We do have a lot going for us. I mean, you just have to look around at the forests and the rivers. I mean, it's a beautiful place, great people for the most part. But um, frankly, if... <laughs> Frankly, if we can get our county economy back on track and get the county budget back on track, this, I don't think any place in the country can compete with us. And frankly, I don't think any place in the world can compete with us. I've done a lot of traveling and I love it here. Um, we definitely do have a lot of problems facing Douglas County. It seems like they're all coming up at once. Very complicated issues, but I will bring an independent voice to the Office of County Commissioner. I don't owe anybody anything. None of the current establishments helping me get elected. So I would appreciate your vote in November. Thank you very much. I again wanted to thank everybody for coming out tonight and for staying for the whole thing and asking such great questions. Um, I'm running for county commissioner because like you, I believe that one person can make a difference in their community. And I've seen that from 2011 when I started working on the river riverfront cleanup project, removing trash and refuse from the river, that working with the communities and having a job to do is is, is part of being a part of this community. Um, when I started my business on uh, Jackson Street, I was there um, every day through the week and I really um, had an opportunity to understand the real issues that our downtown's facing and the lack of support that the downtown businesses are receiving on a regular basis. Um, I am working to better this community every single day. Every single day that I wake up, I, I am doing the research and I am doing the work to better this community and to better the connection with the citizens, with their local government. And the track record and proves it. So please just Google my name, find me on Facebook. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Earlier I mentioned that I had been uh, away for about 29 years from the county. Those 29 years that I was away from the county, I was taking vacations here in Douglas County because I love this place. This is where I wanted to end up and I did. It's awesome. Here, um, while I was gone, I had a government job. I was working for the Defense Contract Management Agency and like we mentioned earlier about privatization, I actually have experience in making sure that contractors are giving the government the most bang for their buck. I can do it. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I grew up here in Douglas County and uh, I did t do my time in the service, 20 years. Um, we all know Douglas County is heading towards a lot of financial problems and people have been calling the uh, commissioners CEOs. Now, nobody hires a CEO right out of the gate. CEOs take years of training, experience, education. I have two business degrees. I have an engineering degree. I've led multi-million dollar repair and building projects and I can be walk right in the doors and start helping the county commissioners. One of the things I wanted to come up here today and we didn't talk about it is children. Well, I'm a grandfather. Children are our future. We have got to pull our education system here in Douglas County out, buck out of the ice age. This core classes and every uh, other programs they have here aren't happening. Joe Lane's now requiring um, extra classes happen weekly. All right, well, thank you. Um, that concludes our question and answer session. Um, I'd like to thank all the candidates again for coming, and I'd like to thank our audience. I'd like to thank our audience because you wanted to be informed before you vote. <laughs>